Okay, looks like it's seven o'clock uh, East Coast, four o'clock here on the West Coast. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. It's nice to see everybody kind of zoom into the room with the screen lights up and um, it's really sort of the best part of a lot of our weeks when we get to see all of our friends and colleagues uh, together on a call like this. So thank you again for being with us tonight. Uh, there's definitely a lot going on in the world around us. Uh, there's a lot going on specifically as well in the world of dermatology. Um, my name is Joe Gorelick. I'm the uh, founder and president of the Dermatology Education Foundation. And um, this is our third weekly uh, DEF video series. So thanks again for coming. Uh, I'm a nurse practitioner in dermatology. Um, uh, I've, my office is still open, uh, very limited uh, office hours though, as our patient volumes dropped uh, to about 50 to eight, by about 50 to 80%. So I'm just working a few days a week seeing uh, patients that uh, need to come in. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I've incorporated telemedicine into our practice. So my day sort of consists of seeing some regular patients and doing telemedicine in between. Um, I think it's important if you have the opportunity, your practice still, is still open to be able to see live patients. Uh, just an example, our practice um, closed many of our offices, but we have a few that are open. And the few offices and providers that are still working uh, since the crisis started have found uh, 13 uh, melanoma in situ, 20 invasive melanomas, one Merkel cell carcinoma, uh, found one patient with Steven Johnson syndrome that had to be hospitalized and diagnosed two patients with bolus pemphigoid. So, you know, in dermatology as nurse practitioners and physician assistants, uh, that's really the essential service that we provide specific to the times that we're in now is by keeping our patients out of urgent care and out of the emergency rooms. We had one patient present to our practice with um, chicken pox that was verified uh, with culture results. The patient had been in three different urgent cares uh, and misdiagnosed. So it's really important that us in dermatology uh, be available to our patients so that we can keep them out of those environments. So tonight we're going to um, focus a little bit about uh, where we stand in our careers as nurse practitioners and physician assistants in dermatology. I want to preface tonight's conversation by saying that all of the advice and information that we're going to provide tonight is based on the most up-to-date data available. The current regulatory system, as we all appreciate, uh, remains extremely fluid. So please follow the guidance provided to you by your practices, uh, practice within your collaborative agreements, and working with your supervising physicians, as well as uh, following the um, board of licensing uh, of your local uh, boards and states. Uh, we've got to do that to maintain that work, to make sure that we're maintaining compliance as we take care of our patients during this time. In addition, uh, it's really important that we also follow the mandates and directions that are um, constantly changing by our local, state, and government um, bodies. So the legal requirements and employment laws are going to vary between states. So please confirm um, in your local state um, any guidance that you receive from us tonight uh, and confirm it with your local legal and financial experts. So our dermatology nurse practitioner and physician assistant community continues to benefit, benefit from this collaborative uh, environment and sharing information with each other as we gain these new experiences and traverse this really difficult and ever-changing time. Uh, NPs and PAs need to work together now more than ever. We need to share our resources so we can evolve and thrive together as we navigate through this crisis so as we come out of it, um, our learnings can help us uh, build our practices back up, get busy, and thrive again. So tonight we're going to have a discussion uh, re about the status of our employment. Unfortunately, many derm dermatology offices are closed. Um, and they were closed either because they were uh, forced to close by uh, government or state rulings, um, and or the practice owners decided to close uh, for um, because they thought it was the best thing to do. Some offices are still open with limited hours, and I think we're all now 
using teledermatology. So as the revenue for our practices is diminished, um, so has the employment uh, of many of our colleagues and many of us are having our hours reduced, reduced or have been furloughed or laid off. So the goal of tonight's call is to share resources and information to help guide us through these uncertain times until the practices uh, return to prosperity and we can emerge from the pandemic. So we're joined tonight uh, by a physician assistant and my good friend, Kara Gooding from Arizona. Kara is a Dermatology Education Foundation Advisory Council member. She's also practicing teledermatology and her practice with very uh, limited office hours. Kara, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, We're also joined by Michelle Sullentrup. Michelle is the CEO of MyDerm Recruiter, a consultancy group that is 100% dedicated to dermatology. So Michelle's going to share with us more about the layoffs in dermatology and how the stimulus package may benefit you as well as the unemployment application process, which I think is new to all of us. She'll also share some hope for those of you that are looking for new positions during this global pandemic. So Michelle and her firm are really advocates, are true advocates of dermatology nurse practitioners and PAs. Um, and um, as such, in pursuing a position for you, she doesn't take a fee from you as a nurse practitioner or physician assistant. So Michelle, thank you for joining us this evening. We really look forward to your insights. So okay. at the end of the evening, um, or probably tomorrow morning, we'll post a summary of the resources that are referenced during the call tonight. Uh, this will be posted on the blog page of our website, dermnppa.org. Uh, we've received quite a few questions from all over the country uh, prior to the webinar. Uh, so we've put them together and they've been incorporated into the discussion. So I hope that that addresses a lot of our common concerns. We'll do uh, our best to get to everything um, during the call tonight, but if we don't, um, we'll post um, the frequently asked questions and some answers in the blog session, in the blog section. Throughout the call, please uh, feel free and send in your questions to our host, Stacy Moore of Physician Resources via the chat uh, function in the Zoop Groom chat. So Kara, Let's kick off with a little bit um, of your experience. Um, Kara, if you could just sort of walk us through and share with us your current work situation. Uh, also, if you could let us know uh, a little bit about the experiences that have been communicated to you by our fellow nurse practitioners and PAs around the country. I know that you and I have talked a lot about that and. Um, and uh, getting a lot of um, calls and texts uh, from people uh, from this coast all the way to the other coast and everywhere in between uh, sharing their experiences. So Kara, please uh, thank you again for joining us. And um, if you could share your experiences, that would be fantastic. Sure. Thanks again, Joe, for having me. It's great to see so many faces there, familiar faces. I think we are all craving social interaction of any type at this time as we become more and more socially isolated. So thanks everyone for joining tonight. And I will start a little bit with my own experience throughout this pandemic. So I, I guess in some regards had the, the, the good fortune of being able to go on a vacation the second week in March. And this was just at the time when COVID-19 had started to infiltrate into the US, but really wasn't, had, didn't have a huge presence. So still, still felt good about going on vacation. And uh, midway through our vacation in Hawaii, I knew things were getting a little strange and things were amping up when I got a text message from my own mother saying that she thought we should bring home some toilet paper from Hawaii. And I thought, oh my goodness, okay, this is really getting serious. So by the time we returned on Sunday, the 14th of March, I went, you know, felt great, went into work on Monday, saw a full schedule of patients. And that evening I woke up in the middle of the night and unfortunately I had a sore throat and kind of a stuffy nose. And I knew at that time that there was no way I could go in to see my patients. And so I had to call in sick and Unfortunately, by the end of that day, I received a message from my human resources to say that since I had traveled off of the mainland 
US that I was going to be quarantined for 14 days, which you know clearly I understood, but was really a hard pill to swallow at that time coming back from vacation. So that re the rain re remainder of that week, our clinics remained open. We started to see some volume decrease. By the second week, our clinics were really diminishing in volume and we had actually instituted telehealth. So I was lucky enough to, to get in and start telehealth without having to take a full two weeks off of work. Now we are doing primarily telehealth. I do four days a week and then I have one half day per week in the clinic where I'm allowed to see emergency patients only. So we are very, very limited in what we can see. I did go in today for my one half day and saw 21 patients and was running around like crazy, but it felt really good to have some sense of normalcy for at least a half a day. So that's been my experience. Um, overall, I've had a good experience with my, my practice. I do work for a half private equity owned practice and half provider owned practice. And up until this point, they've been very good to us. I feel very lucky to be there. Uh, just this week, they did ask us to take a reduction in our salary, which you know is to be expected at this time with the amount of revenue that's being generated. So as far as my colleagues throughout the US, I've talked to providers in all pockets of the country. And the bottom line is there is no difference. Um, unfortunately, many of our colleagues have been furloughed. Many have been asked to take a reduction in their salary or a reduction in their percentage of collections. Talk to one of my friends who will have no salary for 90 days and has been asked to take just a 25% of collections of telehealth, which unfortunately we all know is really not a long-term viable source of income. So that's very tough. We have also seen many of our colleagues who have been just let go from their practices. And that's not just people that are in, you know, have a few years of experience. These are providers that have, you know, even 25 years of experience who have really just been let go and have no jobs at this time. So we're all in this together. I do feel like I'm very lucky. I do feel at this time, you, you do see the true colors of your employer come out during this time. And I feel like some of us are gonna come out feeling very good at the end of this when we get over the, the hump. And some of us are going to feel like we need to find new jobs or if we don't have a job, we'll be looking. And so tonight we'll provide some resources. Um, we have Michelle with us who is an expert who's gonna provide her expertise. But one of just my own recommendations is really to reach out to your pharmaceutical representatives and make sure that you're keeping an open relationship and open dialogue with them. Not only are they coming in and providing us with education and samples and rebate cards, they are our friends and they are a fantastic resource for us when we're looking for jobs. They're in the practices, they know who has openings, and they know if you might be a good fit for that practice or maybe you're not. So make sure you're keeping an open relationship with them, texting them. And also when we get over this hump and, and God willing, we'll be back at live meetings soon. I think that's also going to be an excellent resource for us to attend again, networking with our colleagues throughout the country and being able to interact with the pharmaceutical industry and all the assets that they have for us. So I'll let Michelle take over from here and provide her expert information to us. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, no, that, I, I agree 100%. I, I hope that um, and everything looks like uh, right now that we're going to be able to go live in August with uh, Durham 2020. So um, Michelle, thank you again for uh, being here. Uh, let's get right into the opportunities for all of us and get some more expert insights into the employment and unemployment part of this time that we're in. Um, Michelle has shared some slides for you. Um, you can look at them and download them from the chat section, and we'll also share them on our e-blast tomorrow. So let's kick off with a little bit about uh, what, may be, what may be on most of our minds um, as, we, um, as, we trans <laughs> as we sort of try and get through these crazy times. Um, so Michelle, Please uh, share with us your insights. Sure. Um, so a couple of the topics that I want to make sure that we are discussing are, you know, obviously layoffs, furloughs. Is there a difference between being laid off and furloughed? Um, hours being cut back, going to 100% telemedicine. What does that mean? 
Um, what does that mean for your contract that you actually have in place with your employer? And then how can pieces of the new stimulus package help you? Because there are some parts that aren't going to apply um, due to either income limitations or um, the way that you're employed. But there are new laws, there are um, great unemployment benefits that are available, and we'll talk about that. And then we'll also talk a little bit too just about searching for a new position, either now or later. I mean, I think it's a great point what Kara said that, you know, at My Derm Recruiter, we are 100% dedicated to dermatology. And as much as we love our clients, they're fantastic. They pay us to go out and find you, but your top talent is what they pay us to find. And so if you discover at the end of this epidemic that you really aren't in the spot you wanna be in, obviously we can help you to find a new opportunity. It's 100% free, no cost to you, but also to just help you get through it as well um, in the meantime is really important to us. So. Again, my name is Michelle Solentrop. I am the CEO of My Derm Recruiter. I've been in business since 2014. Um, we have one-on-one -on -one consultative job search coaching for all of you available. Um, I am easily reached on my LinkedIn page or Michelle at MyDermRecruiter.com. I'm happy to help you with anything I can regarding your job search or just talking to you a little bit about what you're going through. I'm happy to do that too. Um, but the great, great news that I want to start out with that's really exciting is that you are in the field of dermatology, and it's a, still a highly underserved specialty, so you are still much sought after as far as your skill set goes. So we have clients nationwide in 49 states that we represent who are looking for qualified derm NPs and PAs, so that's the great news to start out with. Um, so you will be among the first to go back to work um, and go back to normal, per se, um, as normal as we're going to get uh, starting out um, after this pandemic is done. So there's three areas that um, part of the stimulus package um, that I want to go over quickly with you, which the first is the stimulus check, right? You know, they've sent out a lot of them already. Um, if you're the breadwinner in your family, you may receive a stimulus check. But basically, it's based on your adjusted gross income for 2018 um, or 2019 if you've already filed. Um, but basically, you are, as you've seen on the news, you know, if your adjusted gross income as a single person is $75,000 or less, they pay $1,200. But really, I think where it comes into um, is if you have um, a married couple who is making, you know, um, 150,000 or less, the 2,400 comes in to factor there. Um, but there are basically it's 1,200 for individuals up to that 75,000 mark. It's 2,400 for married couples up to that adjusted 150 annually. And then it's 1,200 for head of household whose adjusted income or adjusted gross income is 112.5 or less. Plus there's $500 per child. But we found a loophole that basically, if you have a 17 year old, they don't get a check and you don't get a check for them either. So it's pretty much 16 and under if you have a child that you'll get that. So we know a lot of you are uh, pushed out of that um, due to income, which is a good thing, right? Um, because it means that you're, you're making above what the average uh, American is making. So I think the major questions are really about unemployment because lots of you have never applied for that. You've never had to. You never had to go down this road before. But um, one rule of thumb when it comes to unemployment is the safe bet is if your pay has decreased in any way due to COVID-19, you should apply. Even if you're, um, basically you have paid into this unemployment fund, every payroll check that you've been paid um, at this employer and any employer you've ever worked for, and you know, if you're not able to work due to COVID-19, you're most eligibly, you're most likely eligible. There's no penalty for you or your employer for you to apply. Um, and I will tell you that some people are initially being denied, and it's because their state systems, which your unemployment state system is absolutely in charge, but it's because they have not caught up um, electronically, basically. So their websites or their forms or parts of their system have not actually caught up yet. Um, so don't be too panicked if you get a, um, a denial at first, because there, we've heard that a lot throughout the country, and then second time around, it's usually going through. Um, but furloughed versus laid off, what's the difference? Um, bottom line is, in this time frame, they're really both exactly the same right now, because 
Um, when it comes to unemployment, due to the laws that have recently been put in place by the federal government, normally the difference would be if you were furloughed, you wouldn't have to look for work while you were furloughed because you have a return date. But because of the COVID-19, you don't have to be looking for work anyway. So it really doesn't matter. Furloughed, laid off, it's pretty much the same thing as far as unemployment is concerned. So um, those new guidelines, which are part of the stimulus package, or what protect you from having to go out and look for a job and still be able to collect unemployment. Um, and the difference between regular unemployment from your state that you typically have heard about and the extra federal money that you're hearing about um, is that extra 600 per week that the federal government is offering. So if you go, your state is in charge of your unemployment. I want to be really clear about that. Some states are better at it than others. I'll use Missouri as an example because that's where we're at. But I know in Illinois, I have many clients and many candidates that I've worked with in place, and they're having tons of problems. So Illinois has been a little bit bumpy. Um, and if your state is not as populated and doesn't have a city like Chicago in it, it may not be as bad for you. Um, but you must check your regular state website to find out how, how much unemployment you're eligible for. So they use a different formula for each state, and the amounts vary wildly. So um, for example, in Missouri, it's $320 a week. In Maryland, it's like $875 a week. So it's totally different based on um, each state. So now with the Federal Care Act, you're eligible for that in the state of Missouri, that $320 a week. And then the Federal Care Act will add $600 a week due um, on top of that. So in the state of Missouri, it would be $920 a week that you would be eligible for for unemployment. Um, and that's our full-time unemployment. With that being said, even if you're laid off partially, you're still eligible for unemployment. If you've had any change, remember that golden rule kind of thumb rule, any change of your pay in any way because it's been decreased, you should be applying for unemployment. Even if you're only getting partial unemployment, you'll still get that full 600 a week from the federal government. So that federal government um, payout that's new, that is um, slated right now, as of today, um, to last through July 31st. So the CARE Act also will extend your state level unemployment insurance. So by an additional 13 weeks. So in Missouri, like we have 26 weeks of unemployment. Well, this new bill that's passed extends it for 13 weeks. So now there's a total of 39 weeks available. And then that extra 600 is going to go through July 31st. And the total benefit package, though, as far as extending those additional weeks and everything, so say you didn't get laid off until next week, all of that is still eligible and available through December 31st of 2020. So the new federal laws um, for unemployment extension is through December 31st. The extra 600 a week is through July 31st. Okay. So, Michelle, can yeah. I turn in? Sorry. Um, that was, that was, I think that really helped address a lot of the questions that we're getting. It um, did. And yeah, I just want to clarify, we're getting some questions also, just more specific to um, us having hours reduced or our pay reduced. So, um, one, one of the questions is, um, my pay was reduced 70% as a temporary measure to deal with um, my reduced loss of volume of patients. Mm -hmm. um, the practice has furloughed everyone else. Um, does reducing a PA's salary this drastically during an unprecedented time violate any existing employment contracts? Uh, what happens if my pay is not increased uh, when we return to normalcy in a few months? Yeah, great question. That's on a lot of people's minds. That's definitely, that's probably the most asked question. So there's a couple of things you need to know about this. So it's a little bit of a long answer, but I want to make sure you're really clear on this. So typically a contract between you and employer is most sacred document to the, to the law, right? As far as being recognized by the law. And typically your employer must uphold any contractual agreement that they have with you unless there's a clause in that contract. So it's very important that you have a copy of your contract, you print it out and take a look at it. And you're gonna look for any stipulation clauses um, that might be in there. But with that being said, um, you need to also look how you're paid in that contract. Are you paid for patient encounters 
or a specific number of hours worked per week equals you get this salary. Typically, employers tie their compensation to those things. Um, but also, with that being said, um, most states also have something in place that is a legal term that many of you probably have never heard of in your life, and it's called force majeure. So force majeure um, is actually utilized very um, unoften because we don't have global pandemics very often, but most states have something in place called that um, that's utilized under situations they're not able to be foreseen, not able to be forecasted or prepared for. So it's a widely unknown term, like I said, um, and that is um, going to allow some of them um, to adjust what they have in writing with you. Now, with that being said, here in Missouri, it's called a, com a doctrine of commercial frustration. Okay, so what, and each state kind of names it something different, but it is based on federal law. So that force majeure clause says that a contractual provision allows for the risk of non-performance in the event that it becomes impossible or impractical for a party to perform its under obligation under the contract. Well, if you have a statewide emergency or you have a national emergency, it's a pretty good argument for them not to have to pay you. That doesn't sit well with us, right? We, we're, you know, we understand, but we want our contracts upheld. So, um, and it's also equally important to note that even if they don't have that clause, some of them will have that clause in your contract. I've actually reviewed several this week that had it in there, which surprisingly. And we're seeing it being added all the time now. So any new contracts you get, you're probably gonna see that force majeure in there. Um, but it doesn't mean that they can't make it, that argument in a court of law. So it kind of comes down to, you have to decide, do you wanna pursue a conversation and mediation of the terms of your contract, or do you wanna have a legal discussion with your employer regarding your contract? Like you said, many people are being cut back on hours or being cut back on things, and they're supposed to get you know, back up to normal as they're able to do so. And some employers I know nationwide have agreed to do a firm up at the end of the year. They'll say, help us out now. We'll do a firm up at the end of the year as long as those collections are coming. So you know, don't, you know, don't worry about it, we'll take care of you. We have some clients that are saying that to candidates. Then we also have clients going, I have no idea. We don't know what's going to happen yet. We don't know how long this is going to go on. So I would highly encourage you, if your contract is a major concern to you and you don't feel confident with your current employer taking care of you on that contract, you should seek legal advice with a copy of your contract. If you need a good employment law, <coughs> again, I'm happy to help you. I have a great one. Um, but I would tell you that you kind of have to decide, you know, before you have that legal discussion with them versus a mediation or a uh, problem solving discussion with them, that you get the advice of attorney on what to comment on and what to ask about from your employer. I know that's a long answer, but everybody's contract is so wildly different that we have to almost look at them individually. But I will tell you that a lot of these um people who are concerned about lawsuits and such and you know wanting to get their money from their contract i think that due to those state emergencies and federal emergencies it's going to be a hard road to go that's great um so just uh we're getting um i'm just gonna i'm trying to feel the questions as they're coming in um so we can all be very very clear at the end of the hour um the most common uh concern again is regarding unemployment and um, applying for unemployment insurance. So if you have more than one employer, um, do you get the full amount from your primary job? Uh, does the $600 a week happen every week or only at, uh, only at first? So even if you have two part-time jobs, you will apply for unemployment with your state and your state will actually ask you how many hours you work with at a, a week with this job and how many hours you work a week with that job. The good news is in your state, those employers are reporting that income to the state because they are a business in the state. So most of your unemployment um, sites on, on the online will already have that data in there, but some may ask you, what are your gross earnings over the last four quarters with that employer and then with this employer? But I'm gonna tell you 90% of the time, they already have that data. So okay. you don't have to fill that in. But yes, you can apply for unemployment even if you have multiple jobs as a peer and pee with different practices, and the $600 is every single week that you are qualified and approved for unemployment in your state. 
So if the state says, yes, you get employment, even if it's $70 a week, say you only work one day a week or whatever it was, and it was only $100 a week, you're going to get $100 plus that $600 from the federal government every week as long as you're unemployed and approved all the way through July 31st. So it is, it could be here in the state of Missouri, it's 920 a week, it's almost $4,000 a month. Now we know most of you make, you know, way more than that, but it at least does help you have that buffer. So just one other uh, follow-up question um, related to that, and then I think that I think that we should be pretty clear. So this question is, we should apply for unemployment if we had any change in pay, correct? Correct. Okay. You really but if we are still receiving a paycheck, could that prevent us from being eligible for unemployment uh, reduced hour pay? So each state has their own rules about it, but I will tell you in our research and with our HR consultants and our employment law attorney, that 79% of the time, probably more than that, they like to be conservative. When you go on to apply and you say my hours have been cut due to COVID-19 or my pay has been cut due to COVID-19, because of what you earned in those last four quarters, they take that, that makes you eligible or not. Most everyone will be eligible for COVID-19. So yes, even if you're getting paid, so say you're still making $600 a week. What they do is every week that you report your unemployment, you will actually put in what you earned that week. So that means the money you received. So if you got a check this week for $600, and your unemployment is 500 from the state and 600 from the federal government, that week you may not get unemployment. There's a really formula, each state has their own formula how they figured it out. But then the next week you would get that unemployment or you would get a portion of that unemployment. But I know it's very frustrating, but literally if you Google whatever state you live in, unemployment office, and you, there's always a calculator on that website. So yes, you can still earn money, while you're on unemployment, you just have to report that. The key with the unemployment office is being very, very transparent and clear with them. So saying in the little box that they allow you to kind of type and fill in, I'm, I usually work 40 hours a week, I usually get this much pay, and I usually get this much bonus, and I'm cut down to this now. They already have, like I said, usually your data of what you've earned over the last four quarters. So they take that with a formula to set what you're gonna get for the week up to the maximum. And so even if during a week you earn 300 and then the next week you earn 1500, as long as you report that each week that you claim the unemployment, then typically you're gonna remain eligible as long as it's a difference in what you earned previously, which it usually is, um, and it's an average over the last four quarters, then you would still be completely eligible. If, if you're not, they're gonna tell you. They'll say, you know, sorry, this week you don't qualify, you earned too much, or you earned over the amount we would have paid you, so you don't get it this week and then you reapply on that next Sunday. But anytime you have any cut, any type of financial, um, we are being told by our employment law attorneys and our HR consulting firm, apply. Because there's, no, um, there's no downside. It's not anything that's reportable on your credit or anything that hurts your employer or hurts you. And these are really unprecedented special circumstances. So they're approving way more than you would even think possible. Okay, great. And then I see a, a specific question about when you, if you go on to the website and, and file for unemployment, it's one website that covers everything, state and local, local. It's just one particular application, correct? Yes. Yeah, so you only have to apply with your state unemployment office. The state receives the money from the federal government and then the state pushes out that extra 600 with your state unemployment. So there's no federal site, there's nothing you have to do in that regard. The states are taking care of that. Um, I think that we will likely have another stimulus that may not work that way, may just come direct to us. Um, like the stimulus checks, right? They're separate from unemployment. So on this unemployment though, there's nothing else you have to do. You just have to file with your state unemployment. Now on the stimulus check, if you're eligible for that, that is coming straight from the federal government. They're going to deposit that check into the account that you had a direct deposit in and that you filed on your tax return in either 2018 or 2019. If you didn't have a direct deposit with your tax return um, or you uh, didn't do an electronic withdrawal if you owed, then they're going to mail you a check to the address that was on your 2018 or your 2019 return. 
if you know all of that data is wrong or no longer accurate, they're encouraging you to file your 2019 if you haven't already. Most people who filed their 2019 are either at the same address or have the same bank account. So they're counting on that to be um, enough, but there will likely be um, a site put up too that you can apply if those don't work for you. That's great. Okay, so um, we have got some more questions. Um, this one uh, we're getting quite a few about, and it's specific to another program, the Payroll Protection Program. So um, you know, we're all wondering what, um, th what things, what benefits our employers are um, applying for and getting. And um, I think that's a direct question we need to ask the people we work for or with um, to make sure that we're in the loop. And so we have a really uh, clear understanding of what they're getting, if they're getting loans that are gonna be forgiven or if they're uh, receiving uh, or were able to uh, participate in the payroll protection program. So specifically the payroll protection program. Um, this question is re reads, I've been retained full time, working from home, but received a pay cut, as did the entire team. If my employer takes the payroll protection program loan, are they required to restore my full salary? Um, and would they be required to supply uh, back pay? Um, they are not required to do anything with your salary. Um, to start out with. To be clear, the PPP is attractive to employers because parts of them can be fully forgiven, right? And employers do have to follow strict criteria and use funds for certain criteria um, to have it forgiven, um, or part of it or the whole thing can be turned actually into a loan that they have to pay back. So they're gonna be incentivized, um, but yes, part of the funds that they get from PPP do need to be used for payroll but it's a percentage, okay? Because they can also utilize those PPP loans for rent, mortgages, utilities, health insurance for the team, things like that. But the Small Business Association on April 2nd, they released guidance that said that at least 75% of the loans must be spent on payroll um, to qualify for forgiveness. So they're being incentivized to pay you. Um, but with that being said, um, if all of well, let me back up. Regarding that forgiveness, the PPP, that only covers wages for employees up to $100,000 annually for each employee. So in other words, that max amount per employee that the business can be forgiven when it comes to payroll is 100,000. So if you work there and you have three PAs next to you and you all make well over 100,000, they are only gonna be forgiven up to 100,000 per person. So, and it's based on um, what you're actually, you know, what you've earned over the past years and such. So it's not as if they're gonna get some windfall and they're gonna decide to keep it all um, for themselves and not pay you because again, 75% of that loan has to be paid out to employees for it to be forgivable. But I will say um, that really it is up to them how they, how they handle that. They're not, um, they're not penalizing them in a way except for making it not forgivable, which is huge, right? But if not all employees are kept, or a majority of the employees, it's, I think it's actually 75% of the employees, if they're not brought back and put on to at least 75% of their normal schedule and compensation by June 30th, that's what it is right now, um, which could change, of course. Um, but basically, if, they're, if employees are not kept on payroll, the forgivable amount will be reduced for them. Um, and will also reduce if they lower more than 25% of your salary of any employee. So if they lowered you more than 25% of what they were paying you before this happened, that makes their loan less forgivable. So can they do, will, are they, do they have to pay you? Do they have to do anything? No, they don't, unfortunately, they don't. But the government has incentivized them to make sure you're getting at least 75% of your pay. So, 200, yeah. So, but the problem is, is when they're, so the, I think the big picture with the PPP is that um, it's really going to benefit the business as a whole. Yep. Um, and it, part of it may be forgiven, yet um, we cannot expect 
that met it, that and we're not entitled based on the law for that to uh, fill our salaries back up or pay us back pay. So no, because unfortunately they can, you know, just reduce their forgivable amounts, but they do have to use it for rent, utilities, things like that. They can't just bonus the CEO, um, which is a good thing. Yeah, unfortunately for a lot of us in the uh, the way that our pay is structured, whether we're salaried, whether we are. Uh, take a draw and then are paid out um, on percentage or we're 100% percentage um, because we're high, high wage earners, um, the amount of forgiveness that's going to be given or the amount of benefit that, to the company um, by only getting being able to get $100,000 isn't going to likely be spread to us or to our salaries. Um, and I totally so understand that. That is so true. And I think that's what has caused, I think as people are realizing that, in higher earners um, groups, um, they are going back to that first question that we talked about, like, well, wait a minute, I have a contract here, right? So unfortunately, global pandemic, we've never done this before, right? But if you, I, my advice on that simply is to speak to your employer about it, because we do know of employers who are sitting down with their staff and saying, we don't know what's gonna happen yet, but our goal is to make you whole by the end of the year. So maybe if you can have a conversation like that, or if they can apply collections, um, advance of collections to make your salary whole, there are ways to do it. And to be um, clear with you all as well, we're educating employers on how to do it as well, to make sure that they're keeping the great talent that they have. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's so important. And I think that, um, again, nobody knows where we're going to be in two months. Um, nobody knows, you know, what our, you know, when our patient volume is going to return to where it, where it was, and that's really going to what that'll be what determines, um, you know, what our compensation is going to return to. So um, several questions are about um, the SBA, so the uh, Small Business Association loan, and um, people are hearing that it's run out of money or it's hard to apply for. Um, I think that what I can say is I was on a call with. Um, with dermatologists, um, over 100 different dermatology uh, groups and dermatologists that own their own practices, and they're applying for all of these things. Um, the process, though, to get the money um, is incredibly difficult. Um, oftentimes, they go through six or seven hours of applications, and then the system crashes. Uh, the banks are being, are the, the, when you apply for a loan, you're being directed to a specific bank to get the loan. And oftentimes those banks are not taking applications anymore. So it's a very frustrating process. Um, and whether the, um, there's money left or not, we can't tell you, but the process is really uh, difficult. And again, uh, Michelle alluded to this, you've really got to connect with your provider or with your uh, owner of your practice and just, um, ask them what their uh, plans are and what they're applying for um, and how you can work together so that you can work out uh, something that's beneficial for you as well as the practice. So um, you know, these are uncharted waters and um, the, I think that no dermatologist or dermatology group wants to go out of business. They definitely want to be successful. None of us want to lose our jobs or want to have a reduction in our income. Um, but we were nobody knows what's going to happen. So over the next few months, uh, after a few more months, we'll have a better idea. Yet uh, for the next few months, I think we really all have to work together with our practices to find a way where we're both giving. You know, we're all giving a little bit, and then hopefully at the end, uh, it works out. Our patient volumes pick up, and we're generating income uh, for the practice, and we're taking home uh, the same sort of income or close to it as we've been for the past several years. Um, so I think we've covered a lot. Michelle, what other um, things do you think are important for us uh, to be aware of uh, or to ask as we're going through these um, times with our practices? Um, I would just echo your sentiment that um, applying for an SBA loan, which I had to do, um, is extremely arduous. And um, I think that your employers likely have not had a lot of time to digest all of the ways in which the stimulus package has affected them yet, because there are HR matters as well um, that are coming at them. Um, so it is a very tumultuous time. And I think in the next four weeks, we are gonna get more information and we probably will get more 
um, uh, more small business loan availability over the next few weeks from the federal government. So that is a good thing, hopefully. Um, but one other thing that's come up is um, employee rights. There's a lot of new employee laws wrapped around as well. One thing I would encourage all of you to know is that um, there's a Families First Coronavirus Response Act. If you Google that, it's the FFCRA. That it requires employers, if God forbid you were to get sick or someone that you know or a family member was to get sick and you were required to take care of them, the FFCRA Act does require employers to um, pay you for up to two weeks of your compensation. So, um, and that's your regular compensation. That is not your modified compensation. So um, I would encourage you, that is on the, um, the uh, government agency website, it's the wage and hour division. It's a new poster that's gonna go up for you um, in your break room, and obviously lots of you are working from home or not working right now. But I think that's something you should all be aware of as well because a lot of hospitals, um, groups that we work with, um, they are allotting those 80 hours as COVID hours basically in case you or your family member needs it if anyone does become ill. I think that's just one thing I want to make sure that all healthcare workers know about. And we had a specific question about um, uh, people have heard that there are going to be some healthcare specific funding directed towards um, um, healthcare providers. And we had a specific question about that and whether uh, physician assistants would be included in that. Uh, I don't know for sure. I'm assuming they would be. Um, but Michelle, do you have any insight into that? There are some issues um, because that, as that question, I read it um, earlier because it was sent in, um, it alludes to the fact that physician assistants are not considered nurses. Um, and so we, it's a wait and see game. The good news is, is that a lot of the um, uh, PAs, I think on the NP side, you'll be fine, but I think on the PA side, there may be some struggles to get through, but I don't think that the government is going to be holding back right now when it comes to healthcare. So I, it's not something that's been addressed yet, but as soon as it is, we'll make sure and get that data out to you all as well. That would be great. If, as soon as you get that, if you share it uh, with us, we'll get it up on the, uh, on the website, on the blog page as well. Um, so um, a take home message for all of us that have had any reduction in pay is it's worth our time to fill out the unemployment form. Um, my staff in my office, uh, we've had to reduce our entire staff by 30%. The staff that's still uh, around has reduced hours. They've all applied for unemployment. Uh, and they said it takes about an hour to go through the process. Uh, so that's sort of what you're looking at um, in terms of that. Uh, Michelle, do you have any other um, insights? Um, I was gonna say, I'm sorry, just uh, before we bounce back to you, is that uh, one of the things that um, the DEF is committed to is not just you know, the medical edification of nurse practitioners and physician assistants, but also helping us achieve success in our careers. And so uh, what we're leaning towards in August at the Durham 2020 meeting um, is to turn our opening reception, not just into the typical opening reception that we have, but also uh, create an opportunity for you to exchange information with uh, people like Michelle, um, as well as all of the um, industry partners for the Dermatology Education Foundation, all of the companies that are supporting dermatology nurse practitioners and physician assistants will be there. So if you're looking for a job, you connect with these companies and they can hook you up with the local rep in your area who will know where the openings are. So having a combination of someone like Michelle and her firm um, with the industry together is really going to create a unique opportunity uh, for all of us to um, make sure that we're you know, getting the most out of our uh, possible career. So I think that's really exciting. And I want to thank Michelle for being a part of that in advance. Yes, definitely. We would love to do that. Um, one thing I would like to say to everyone again is kind of going back to what I started with. You are in a really great position. It just doesn't feel like it today. Um, so I, this will all bounce back, you know, we will all be, and again, you'll be the first to come back. But I would tell you, I would encourage you as an employer, as someone who speaks to your employers every day, um, is make sure you're during this time and you have some downtime, 
update your LinkedIn profile. If you're not on LinkedIn, get on there. It's really valuable, it's really important. Usually the first spot that a potential employer goes to is on LinkedIn to check you out. Um, it's not Facebook, typically it's LinkedIn. Um, and the other thing I would say is make sure your resume is up to date and highlights all of your dermatology experience because, and if you need help with that, I am willing to help you with that. I'm working at a just a shorter schedule, so I have more time. I'm happy to help you personally with that um, to make sure that if you are going to, in fact, leave a, your current position or you do need to find a new opportunity, we can help you with that today. We still have employers responsibly interviewing via Zoom and via phone um, all over the country because they, they expect us to help build that pipeline. So if you are out of work, definitely contact us. We'll help you. It's 100% free to you. And we know dermatology because it's all we do 100% of the time. So we know the good, the bad, the ugly. We understand um, and we only work with companies that treat you all well. And that's our, that's our main focus. Thank you. Um, so we're continually getting, um, we've got this live feed of messages coming in. So I'm gonna ask um, you to just reiterate uh, just another time, please, to go over the source of funding for the Small Business um, Association loan at this point. It's a common message that's coming in. Um, people are wanna know, they're saying, um, Unless businesses have received a PPP loan, this is a moot point because they're out of money and it's not available anymore. Um, can you speak to that? Um, if they have not, so technically on the news, right? We haven't had an official from the government announcement. On the news, people are hearing that the PPP is empty. It's, it's done, it's out. Um, our, our HR consultants that are in DC and other places are saying another round is coming. Um, so that's good news. But the PPP is not the only loan that they can get um, because the Small Business Association offers what they call um, an economic injury disaster loan. And they also have economic injury, uh, emergency economy, sorry, emergency economic injury grants. Um, and then they just have a regular small business debt relief program too. So there's other avenues. This was special funding for this Payroll Protection Act, and there was some giving to these other categories, but some of these funds were, are still available. Um, so we're even being told too to tell businesses to still apply because they'll be in line for the next round of funding. Okay, um, that's great. Um, so one other question, did the Families First Act apply only for leave after April 1st or was it retroactive? And then the second part of the question is, um, does it apply to NPs and PAs on commission only? Um, it went into effect on April 1st. So it's, it's law, it's in effect right now through the bill that it was signed on that it applies from April 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020. Again, this could be extended, but no, it does not apply before April 1st. Um, and it is basically if you're a 1099 or you are a, um, actually let me look on that one. I think that that one is for W-2 employees only. However, um, it is not just due to illness, it's due to if you don't have childcare, if your kids are out of school and they're gonna be home. Um, there's five, re or sorry, six reasons that you would qualify for leave. But it does say that um, a part-time el employee is eligible for the number of hours that that employee is normally scheduled to work over that two week period. Um, and it also, uh, but it does not address 1099s and it does not address contractors. But right. I will look into that personally. Thank you. Uh, and the other thing is just because you work on commission only, it doesn't mean that you're not a W-2 employee. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes, for instance, I work on commission only. I get a percentage of what I bring in yet I'm a W-2 employee because I get a draw and then I get squared up at the end of the month based on collections. So I think that, I hope that provides some clarity because commission only doesn't speak to 1099 specifically or W-2 only. Um, so we're kind of uh, coming up on the end of the hour here. Uh, Michelle, I want to thank you so much for uh, sure. bringing expertise and insights. And again, we'll be posting uh, information on our blog page at uh, NPPA at dermnppa.org. Kara, thank you again uh, for sharing your expertise and uh, your experience as well. 
Um, you know, we're, we're all in this together. It's been about a month that we've been sheltering in place here in California. We had a few sunny days this week, so everybody kind of started to perk up a little bit. Uh, but then they realized that, you know, we've got a few more weeks of this and potentially another month. So, you know, it's going to be difficult. It's, it's hard to have changes in our normal routines. And I think it's important for all of us uh, to try and uh, get outside as much as possible as spring happens all across the country and um, do fun things and engage with your friends uh, on Zoom or other platforms and your families at home. Uh, connect with each other and your work colleagues, your uh, friends across the country um, via text and these other platforms to get us through these uh, next few weeks and a couple months. And then hopefully at the end of the summer, we'll all be together live in Las Vegas at Durham 2020 at the Encore. So I want to thank Michelle and Kara again. We will continue to host these weekly video series. Um, we rely on you to send in information to us. Um, your questions and your suggestions are what guide the topics for next week. Uh, next week, I think we're going to talk about some of the tools that are available uh, that we use to detect melanoma through teledermatology. So it's an innovative, interesting, um, and really a great um, timely uh, thing for us to explore because uh, as teledermatology um, experts, which we all, if we haven't become yet, we all will become. Our virtual lab code has to have certain things in it so that we can provide the best care possible uh, virtually instead of at the uh, bedside to our patients. Uh, so we hope you all join us again next week. In the meantime, uh, send your emails, questions to us at info at dermnppa.org, or if you'd like to now, drop them into the chat section. We can capture them there. And then for more information, you can always uh, hit the website or follow us on social media. We will be sending out tomorrow morning an e-blast um, that has access to the video or audio of tonight's um, recording. Uh, so you can catch the references uh, that we mentioned tonight there or look for our email, um, our e-blast tomorrow that'll be bulleted and easy to follow. And that you can find on the website at dermnppa.org. So everyone, please. Remain state safe, remain healthy. Um, I guess we're all gonna be spending an hour or two on the computer applying for unemployment based on the information we heard tonight. Hopefully we'll qualify and get a little bit extra uh, cash to help us through these uh, next couple months. So thank you to our panel. And thank you all for joining us next week. We hope everyone fires up their video because I see some names on the screen with their videos hidden. So thanks again, have a great week.